Welcome to NASDAQ Trade Talks, where we meet with the top thought leaders and strategists in TradFi, digital assets, technology, and financial planning. I'm your host, Jill Malandrino, and joining me at the Market Site studio this afternoon, we have Joe Cavatoni, Market Strategist North America for the World Gold Council, Ben Hoff, Global Head of Commodity Strategy at Societe Generale, and Andre Skiba, he's the head of Blue Bay Fixed Income at RBC Global Asset Management. We're here to discuss investment cases for commodities and fixed income in the current macro and geopolitical environments. Gentlemen, it's great to have you with us welcome to trade talks and before we get into the investment cases let's go around the horn here Andre we'll start with you with your macro overview it feels as if it's very dynamic to at least start off 2024 absolutely there's a lot happening uh, a lot of cross currents but also good news uh, US continues to be a resilient economy uh, surprising naysayers uh, on a regular basis um, but a slowdown is coming in our opinion but it's a slowdown that will be welcomed by the markets, especially fixed income markets, because that slowdown uh, coupled with moderating inflation allows for rate cuts to ensue. And every fixed income investor uh, is looking forward to that prospect later this year. All right, and Ben? So what's interesting, I think in the commodity space is really how uh, things are setting up at least at this point of the year for a fairly range-bound 2024, particularly when you look at the energy space. We're in the situation where on the one hand, we've got more than enough crude to go around. We've had um, OPEC plus cut on the order of 5 million barrels per day, which are at some point looking to come back to the market. On the flip side, we have uh, geopol geopolitics, which are extremely supportive, um, always teetering on the brink of um, a potential ex explosion. That's something that's just keeping a floor under markets in spite of what is shaping up to be a much more uh, bearish setup from a supply side than early 2023. Mm -hmm. So definitely something to, for us to watch as the year unfolds. Right. And Joe, your perception? I think I'm just gonna echo what Andre and Ben have said, which is it's all eyes on the Fed still for us, particularly in the gold space. But I like what you've highlighted, Ben, which is that that floor is there because when we think about the gold market, we know it's a global asset. We know that there's lots of attention on monetary policy here, but we're keeping a close look at what's developing onshore in China in terms of the financial markets and the overall economic stability there and where that could go and how that could impact commodity prices, in particular gold. But we're also keeping an eye on those geopolitical risks and how the political landscape in a lot of countries around the world is going to change the policy position of people that could change the overall geopolitical landscape. And that's really a key factor for us to watch. So we've got range bound on the bottom, on the floor, but we also have breakout being held back still until we get that clarity around where the rate markets go. Well, I mean, of course, we also have two big global elections as well. We have US, we've we have UK, and you know, spe yeah. speaking of you know policy sh shifts, I, I don't even feel like there's any clear pathway when it comes to policy. We just haven't heard uh, about policy. So it's going to be interesting to see how the elections impact the global markets. But Joe, how is this impacting gold specifically? It almost feels like it's the perfect storm for gold because of geopolitics and what's happening in, in the economy. It, it is actually 2023, I think, is a standout year for us to demonstrate to investors why the uh, risk protection you get from gold makes sense but also when you start to get clarity on the strategic drivers of gold, economic growth or market risk and uncertainty, volatility in certain aspects of the bond market, equity market, that you're gonna see gold break out. And I think, Ben, you got it right. I think we're gonna be range bound. So we might have a good 2024, but that moving target of when rates are gonna move, you know, we had that run up in December on the gold price. We hit an LBMA fix record in December. That was actually exciting, but we've given a lot of that back, and now we're basically back to where we were, we're hovering. But when we think about these other factors at play, I, I think that the policy position that the U.S. has on China, when we think about the expectations for the election in the U.S., these could be, again, and then ongoing concerns around the Middle East and political, geopolitical events, these are still gonna be these factors that are gonna keep the price supported. Yeah. Yeah, and maybe just to, to add to that, Joe, I mean, I think we're, we're, we're you 100% right, and I'm sure, uh, Andre, you'll have a lot to say about this. We're currently at this inflection point for the Fed where really um, all eyes are on how 2024 is going to shape up and when we're going to see rate cuts, how the U.S. economy is going to uh, behave. And that, of course, all influences real rates, which for any real asset, in particular gold being probably the most important one, is a major driver. In the backdrop, uh, drop, what we've got going on is 
very explosive geopolitics. And this is really, from my perspective, an area where gold is, is quite interesting because, quite frankly, even I, as a commodity guy, can think of a variety of ways of taking views on real rates that are outside of the gold market and probably more liquid than the gold market. But where gold really shines is yep. when we have geopolitics unfold. And we saw this after um, um, October 7th. Um, we saw basically a very stealthy 10% move up um, by gold, um, driven ostensibly by uh, the Hamas attacks on, on, on Israel. Um, what, was, what was fascinating is that part of that orchestra was what was going on in rate space. You had US rates basically rally from around about four and a bit to 5%. At the same time, rates volatility picked up significantly. And this is where, where it gets interesting for asset um, owners who, who are interested in, in um, the, the, the safety angle. So if you're, if you're interested in the safety angle, the most liquid safe market in the world is really US treasuries. But when you end up in a situation where rates fall picks up, we're talking about um, an, 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 a, a daily trading volume in, in, uh, in, in US gubbies of on the order of 750 billion. Gold is a much smaller market, 55 billion um, LBMA, London gold, that's roughly what, what transacts per day. Um, so that's roughly by a, by a factor of 15 smaller. It doesn't take much on the margin to really have an effect on gold prices to move up, just on the basis of what's going on in, in, in rates. Right, and let's hear more about that. Yes, uh, it definitely feels like the market got ahead of itself towards the back end of last year when it would have broken through 4% on the 10-year on the treasury and investors started pricing in more than 150 basis points of rate cuts in 24. Uh, in our opinion, that was a little bit too much uh, and also the market was pricing rate cuts happening a little bit too quickly uh, having said that, inflation is moderating. Uh, so it's more of a question when rather than if. And in our opinion, um, at least 100 basis points of cuts is coming, uh, but probably starting closer to the summer rather than March that has been uh, previously uh, priced in. Um, but that clarity that rate cuts are coming uh, is driving a lot of investors into fixed income uh, markets. We are seeing broad re-engagement of those investors who are sitting on the sidelines, uh, who are placing funds in money market accounts, in uh, safe alternatives to uh, buy some duration, uh, to take a view on the rally in fixed income markets after strong performance in 23 for that trend to continue in 24. And from our perspective, um, the way you look about this uh, should be differentiated between tactical and structural approach. Tactical is a bit tricky right now. Mm -hmm. uh, net issuance of treasuries will balloon over the coming two months. Uh, we're coming from a situation where you had negative treasury issuance to 150 billion positive in March and 300 billion positive uh, in, uh, sorry, in February and 300 billion in March. Uh, that's a lot for the market to absorb. So from our perspective, you might be a little bit cautious um, over the coming weeks when it comes to treasuries, but if we do uh, sell off, that is a great opportunity to position for the rate cuts coming uh, and for those investors who fear that they miss the party uh, at the back end of last year. Yeah, it's interesting because the back end of last year, I mean, everything went up. Right. And then at least from the equity perspective, it started to become the beginning of January. Bad news is good news and good news is, is bad news. But we've seen I would say that it felt like there was a big shift. Let's call it since last Thursday, where c consumer data, inflation data, jobs data, the GDP print came out this morning, which was really quite strong relative to expectations. And the market has really been digesting it well and continuing to hit all time highs. So it feel I mean, in my mind, it feels as if would we rather have a stronger economy, a strong consumer, which you can't bet against the consumer, a strong labor market versus just getting, you know, 25 or 50 basis point cut. Six cuts feels really aggressive. I'd rather have a stronger economy and everyone working in the consumer spending versus just getting 25 basis points off. Well, I think that we would, we would tend to agree with you. I, I think that um, when it comes to the rate cut environment, I, I can't agree with you more. I think that the world is just being, betting too much too soon, too quick, and too heavy on that rate cut. 
and expecting much more out of it than, than, than they're probably going to get. I think right now, from, from where we sit, I think that we're, we're waiting and seeing, and I think that's going to help in terms of the shift from tactical allocations to gold, like you've pointed out. I think that we're victims of that for sure. People are definitely paring back positions. You can see that in terms of the near $10 billion that came out of US ETFs alone last year in the gold market, but I think we're starting to see it again quickly develop in January. But I think once that starts to shift away, the tactical will move to a more permanent allocation or more strategic allocation to gold, and that number will come back online. And then the transparent flows of where investors are going in that ETF market, for example, which is small relative to the overall gold market, you'll see it. You'll start to see it for sure. Now on the consumer side with gold, I think that this is actually an interesting one because it does have a dual nature to it. The savings, the fear trade, the uh, concerns that we saw also in March where we had a pop in the gold price in terms of a systemic event, when we had bank crises in, uh, in the US, you, know, you saw retail demand for gold, coin demand for gold hit a record level in terms of near 40 tons in that quarter alone. So keep an eye on that space because it's often overlooked in the investment landscape that, that there's real physical demand for gold. And that could play out as well when we start to see how the election develops. Mm -hmm. yeah. Ben, let's go back to you for a moment here. We were talking about some of the, the issues that we're seeing in the Red Sea with shipping and so forth. Do you think that can create supply chain issues like we saw during COVID? Is it better or worse or on par? Yeah, so I mean, I think our view on that is very much that, look, causally what generated supply chain issues during COVID was ultimately very much, not exclusively, but very much a story of not having workers to produce in factories, not only one that had to do with moving the goods from point A to point B, also, but not only. What we're facing today is really structurally different. What we're facing today is a much more localized situation. We're talking about Suez. Um, on, I mean, what, what, what should probably be mentioned as well is that it's gone a little bit quiet around this, but we've also got pretty significant issues um, around the Panama Canal related to water shortages that are El Nino generated. That's uh, another major artery for world trade. And the two are kind of compounding one another. But just to give some perspective there, global energy markets have basically gone from one significant crisis to the next significant crisis over the past five years, and have actually proven rem amazingly resilient in terms of getting product from where it's produced to where it's needed, not always entirely without disruptions, but in a relatively smooth manner. And it's very hard to think that this time is going to be different. Yeah. Let's talk about some of the investment cases for fixed income for a moment here. What areas are more attractive than others? Where are you finding value? So we're seeing a broad re-engagement with duration opportunities. And I think there you have a whole scale of risk tolerance that investors have uh, to consider. Those uh, who are still a little bit worried about the economic slowdown and how deep uh, it will be uh, prefer to invest on the investment grade, on the high grade, uh, corporate side and we're seeing uh, a lot of demand for record issuance that uh, we've witnessed in recent weeks uh, and that money uh, is speaking for itself. Investors want exposure to high quality companies with strong balance sheets uh, over the course of uh, this year. But what is interesting is that uh, the fact that US economy has proven naysayers wrong again and again has brought investors back into the high yield market as well. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a slow uh, recovery of demand, but it's happening, uh, which was not the case in 2023. And I think the general uh, conclusion many investors are having is that whether you're looking at investment grade space, whether you're looking at uh, high yield markets, or even securitized space when, with agency mortgages, the prospect for double digit returns is very real. It actually does not take much for you to generate 10% type returns over the coming uh, 12 months. You need a little bit of a rate rally and a little bit of a spread tightening um, to get to those numbers. And all that because the carry of fixed income, the current coupons yields in fixed income already provide you with a lot of return and pay for a lot of sins uh, in case things went uh, awry. So we're seeing broad re-engagement across fixed income spectrum with investors' individual risk tolerance driving whether it's high grade or high yield 
they're putting money to work in. And Andre, you had mentioned earlier that you expect a slowdown at, towards the back half of the year. When you say slowdown, does that potentially mean recession? I feel like this recession has never materialized that everyone keeps t talking about, whether you're citing the yield curve or whether you're citing you know, other data within the macro environment. Jill, you're spot on. Like if you're looking at uh, bank lending surveys, if you're looking at global economic conditions, you would have expected a recession to manifest itself. And that has not been the case in the US. And the key reason why that is happening is because of the strength of the consumer. Mm -hmm. US economy is 80% plus consumer driven. So even though it feels like a recession in parts of the manufacturing sector, uh, consumer remains strong. They have refinanced their mortgages when 30 year mortgages were 3% uh, or thereabouts. Uh, they don't have uh, large credit card balances and uh, they are actually um, managing this higher rate environment with a lot of resilience. So uh, that is the reason why we do expect a slowdown, but a recession is quite unlikely, uh, particularly because of the strength of the consumer uh, at the starting point of the slowdown. Yeah, I mean, when you think about it, rates are still from a historical perspective low. It's not like, you know, we're living in, in the early 80s here. So perhaps you know, wages have grown, right? So, and then perhaps consumers are, are just, this reset that we've had, we're not getting pre-COVID prices. So it feels as if they, you know, locked in lower mortgages, wages have grown, there's a reset here that's taken place that, you know, consumers have to live with. Um, you know, perhaps this is just the, sure. the new um, environment. I, I think the other element that's at play, and Andre, you probably see this regularly, is there's a lot of cash that's still been on the sideline that's coming into the system. I think cash balances are at record levels in terms of where we're seeing them, and, I, and, and that's going to come into play. And I think that that will be something very keen to watch for the, for the year. Well, of course, a big outlier, too, is gas prices. I mean, it makes a big difference when it's at 76, <laughs> you know, a, a gallon versus when it was, you know, over 100. 100 percent. And, you know, like uh, as the commodity saying goes, you know, elections are, are, are won on gas prices, but what drives inflation is really distillates, heating oil. And, um, you know, we're, we're going to have to just see how that pans out this year. Um, you know, I think we're, we're just, just to come back to the point Andre was, was, is, was making, I mean, we have seen um, really a, a historically almost unprecedented speed of rate hikes here. So, you know, from, from a commodity perspective, it's always a little bit difficult to extrapolate out how this time is the same or isn't the same as last time, um, which I think basically is, is, you know, Joe, and I'd be interested to hear your views on this as well, is kind of one of the main um, attraction points for gold as an asset at this point, because what really happens if the Fed gets this one wrong? Doesn't really look like it at all, very much in everyone's blind sight right now, but, you know, truth be told, you know, the, the effect of rate hikes to some extent looks like it's being buffered um, by virtue of what we were just discussing, people refinancing, the consumer looking very resilient, but ultimately if the Fed gets it wrong, gold in that case is exactly what right. you would be looking for, because the one thing that's not going to help you is those, those nice carry proper, um, characteristics that you were talking about in fixed income. Correct. It kind of levels the, the playing field a little bit. And, and I think it puts risk assets in play. Yes. In a, in a very challenging way, in a more, more, more risk kind of uh, environment that will actually make investors gravitate more to the hard landing scenario. Yes. And that'll actually be a, a good environment for gold because it will become a higher allocation on the basis of that fear trade, that, that, that risk trade in your portfolio, the allocation to gold. So we've got our scenario for 2024. We've got the, the soft landing, highly probable, but right behind that, where we are with the hard landing in terms of will we see a recession, will we see a pareback of the economy? And then the one that's bothering me is the when, the, the no landing for now. And I think that that's yeah. the one that continues to kind of hang over us, which is when are we gonna see clarity about whether the Fed has stuck it or not? You know, seven of the last nine recessions, gold has outperformed strong in the environments where we haven't had a recession, when the Fed has managed these rate and hike environments, gold's been relatively flat or range bound like we're talking about. Yeah. And well, last word. Well, one thing to highlight is though, compared to 22, which was a painful year for investors where fixed income lost more than 10%, uh, something that a lot of investors did not expect. The big problem then was that the starting yield was very low right now whether you're looking at treasuries, whether you're looking at credits, you're getting paid four, five, six, eight percent, depending on the asset class. So even if a lot goes wrong, it's actually very difficult to lose money in real terms in that environment. And that is something that gives 
a lot of comfort to fixed income investors. That's why we're seeing money moving from money markets to more active investments. But this is also a great environment for active managers. Because if you're looking at opportunities within fixed income, uh, generic spreads are not that exciting. Whether you're looking at high grade around 100 basis points, whether you're looking at high yield in high 300s, or even agency mortgages around 140, those are not amazing levels by historical standards. But this is exactly the environment where active managers have an opportunity to make a difference and showcase their skills to generate uh, alpha. So there's a lot of exciting um, opportunities ahead, but uh, complacency is not something to be advised in this environment. And I agree with my colleagues that there is a base case scenario, but you have to be prepared for the alternatives. All right, and we'll leave it at that. Gentlemen, appreciate the insight. Thanks for joining us on Trade Talks. And thanks for joining me from the NASDAQ Market Site. I'm Jill Malandrino, Global Markets Reporter at NASDAQ.